Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm very grateful to my sponsors, uh, Jane and, and Greg uh, Gandhi. Where, where are they? There, there they are. Thank you very much uh, for sponsoring my participation. Uh, when uh, Sandra uh, uh, Klein started off by saying, oh, so all speakers were great, and I said, oh, no, now she's going to say, now, unfortunately, we have to put up with Hulsman. <laughs> so I said, OK, I need to uh, tell at least a few jokes about democracy. So, oh, democracy, this will be, will be tricky, right? Maybe uh, there's, there's probably, in, in, the, in the age of wokeness, there won't be any jokes admitted about democracy. <laughs> right? well, so, so, That's not funny. And, <laughs> But I was wrong, so I found lots of jokes. Uh, if you just make a ca very casual uh, search, uh, so this is the great thing. Um, um, uh, what the greatest thing about democracy is that it allows every citizen to do something really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> or the other one is um, uh, the whole world envies democracy, uh, uh, envies America its democracy. It's the best you can buy. <laughs> And the most charming one I came across was, uh, what's the difference between a salmon and a democracy? A salmon can be cured. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as jokes of this sort are allowed, we should be happy. So there's hope in the world. Right? <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the uh, un unmistakable mark of uh, tyranny is uh, the, the grim face of uh, uh, well, lacking pleasure and uh, inability to put yourself in question. So as long as we can joke about ourselves and our country and what we uh, are supposed to hold dear, there's hope. So my topic is uh, Mises on democracy, um, uh, Mises um, and a critique. So Mises uh, is, is known as a proponent of democracy. He thought that it is the best uh, political system. And uh, this needs to be uh, uh, looked with, uh, with uh, circumspection because it, it, it was not endorsing democracy as, as we know it today, of course. So it deserves to be um, uh, studied a bit more closely and to see what are the pros and the cons of his point of view. What are the limits within uh, which we um, can accept uh, his, his views on, on this topic, on government and the role of democracy? What does he mean uh, by this? And that's what I mean by a critique, right? So the critique does not mean a rejection or something like this, just the attempt to grapple with the, the, the weight of the argument and the limitations of the argument. So I, uh, to start off, I, I put up uh, three faces uh, of, uh, uh, venerable uh, philosophers. If, so if you're looking from the left to the right, you, you will see uh, 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 Socrates, uh, Plato, and Aristotle. I mean, there might be other representations as well. And the one thing that they have in common, and which uh, sets them apart from Mises, is that they didn't like democracy. Okay, so Aristotle is, of course, very famous for this. He uh, developed a whole uh, systematic analysis of the different forms of government. In democracy one was one of the least liked uh, forms of, uh, of government. Socrates was, was not liked uh, by his contemporaries in uh, Athens, which, which was a uh, democracy uh, at the time. Uh, he was, uh, as, as you know, he was forced to, to commit suicide uh, because for the sins, for two sins, that he had venerated strange gods and that he had uh, seduced the youth. Okay, so what was the strange god that he had venerated? Well, he had come by a philosophical speculation. He had come to the conclusion that there could be only one god. Okay, so that's not acceptable in democracy. So we have to all all kinds of, of things uh, which have equal value and it needs to be admitted on the on the strict uh, basis of equality. There cannot be a hierarchical, monolithic, or uh, mono. Uh, uh, principle. So that's what is sin. And then he had committed the further sin of convincing the youth that this, uh, this be truth. Um, in our day, uh, or more recent times, we have also uh, very distinguished uh, uh, critiques, critics, uh, critics of uh, democracy. Do you know the person in, in the middle? This is uh, the distinguished fellow of the uh, Mises Institute, Hans Hermann Hoppe. Uh, he is uh, the author of a book with the title Democracy, the God That Failed. Very beautiful. Uh, title. Uh, on the left is, is a person that is dear to my heart. Uh, he's the former bishop of the town uh, where I'm uh, living and, and, and teaching, Angers in Western France, so uh, um, Monseigneur 
uh, Frappel was, a, was a, fa a famous uh, bishop and also member of the French parliament at the end of the 19th century. And he had fairly strong classical liberal views. So he's a proponent of laissez-faire economics and uh, free state and so on, but of monarchy and not of democracy. So he was a member of the parliament who was supposed to try to, to, to vote for a change of the constitution so they become a monarchy again. Well, anyway. And the person on the re right hand side is another French uh, intellectual uh, uh, by the name of uh, Augustin, Augustin uh, Cochin. And he was an historian and analyzed the, um, uh, the, the prehistory of the French Revolution, the making of the French Revolution. How did it come uh, into being? And he, uh, his result was that it was anything but a, a, a grassroots democratic movement, but very much uh, the result of organized uh, efforts uh, on the side of uh, uh, local intellectual elites to produce something that resembled uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. Right? So it was a, a part of a plan that was uh, several decades in the making and that uh, broke to the forefront uh, in the terrible days of 1789 and the following days. So what I'll do in, in my talk now is to present uh, briefly uh, Mises' views on democracy um, and then enter into a critique, and the critique, uh, f first of all, uh, will uh, concern the, the, the principle of democracy itself. Democracy is very often confused uh, with um, a purely voluntary form of, of interaction, a voluntary form of organizing uh, society. Um, and the, I think it's important, especially from an economic point of view, that we always distinguish between voluntary regimes and, uh, and coercion. Uh, and he, I always think here of uh, uh, an anecdote uh, of, uh, uh, involving Walter Bloch, uh, the former libertarian who has now become very uh, friendly to, uh, to, to war warfare and uh, government interventions of various sort. Uh, but Walter is, is um, I think, is just uh, gone uh, on the wrong track. I think, I hope he will recover at some point. But uh, Walter had this um, uh, wonderful uh, exchange with a German a student of uh, political philosophy who came to see him at a conference, was, must have been in the 1990s or 1980s, and so she planted herself just in front of him and said, hello, I'm uh, so-and-so, uh, Susie or whatever, uh, uh, Crystal, uh, <laughs> and I'm a communist. <laughs> and then Walter took her hand and said, nice to meet you, voluntary or coercive communism? <laughs> <laughs> That is so wonderful. And it, it's really what it's all about, because as a libertarian, of course, you're not against communism per se, right? I'm, I'm, with my wife, I'm living in communism. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, I wouldn't recommend it, right? I mean, the, the communist form, it's better if the man has the full control over all the resources and so on. Right? <laughs> but I got myself into this trouble, so I mean, uh, that's just where I am. Uh, and, and people are living uh, as monks and as uh, nuns in, in, in convents and so on, also under fairly uh, communistic regimes. And there's nothing wrong with this at all, because, I mean, the, the whole politics of this shouldn't be of concern for them, because they're just trying to get uh, to heavens and get other souls to heaven as well, right? So it's, uh, this communism is a complete sideshow. So we should look at this coercive element, and this is indeed, as well, I will argue, it's the troublemaker and also vitiates uh, Mises' uh, thoughts on the role that democracy can play in a free society. So what are his uh, thoughts here? Uh, I should uh, briefly address uh, um, what Mises does not argue, uh, and is, he has a fairly original argument in favor of democracy. For, for him, democracy is uh, uh, the principle of, of self-determination. And that uh, principle of self-determination is not sought for its own sake, but sought as a way of preserving the, and facilitating the division of labor. And he furthermore um, uh, reduces the, the weight that the political uh, government may have by uh, expressively addressing the principle of secession. So for, for Mises, self-determination and democracy, uh, democratic government always goes in hand with the possibility of seceding from a larger whole and uh, for the seceding community to either f to form their own government or to, form a di or to join a different government. And then uh, finally, the question of the in economic analysis of, of democracy, what we might call the political economy of, the, uh, of government. So Mises' uh, case for democracy does not uh, rely on various principles such as the ones that 
um, we find in the, the national motto of uh, the, the French Republic, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Uh, so uh, uh, for, for me, this, this was not a matter of liberty, right? A free man could very well uh, do uh, without any democracy and so on. That's not the point. It's not a matter of equality. He definitely did not believe that all human beings were equal. And he said it was one of the big errors of the classical liberals in the 19th century that they thought uh, humans uh, were equal and then all equally endowed with reason and so on. So they said that, that's completely beside the point. And of course, it's also uh, not a matter of fraternity. Actually, he never said anything, uh, as, as far as I remember, about the, the question of fraternity, love, brotherhood, and so on. He avoided these terms. But I can tell you he acted very much on them. Right? So Mises was very much a warm-hearted person who uh, uh, supported not only family members and, and, and uh, people that he distantly knew, but also colleagues with whom he really didn't agree on much. He was very instrumental in getting uh, uh, scholars out of uh, Germany and Austria in the difficult years of the, of the 1930s when there was a pers persecution of, uh, of left-wingers, of communists, and, and so on, not only of libertarians. And he helped them uh, get jobs in the UK and in, in, uh, uh, in Great Britain. And then a few years later, they thanked him by not helping him when he needed support to get a job in the US. Well, uh, it's also not so for him, it's also not a matter of justice. And it's not a matter of just uh, allowing everybody to somehow weigh in the political process, right? So there's another idea, yeah, everybody should be allowed. And otherwise, your, your, your status as a human being, as a, your human dignity uh, is not really uh, recognized if you're not allowed somehow to mingle uh, in, the, in the political process. Mises reasoned completely differently. He said, um, democracy is a way to facilitate the division of labor. The division of labor is the reason why people get together. The division of labor allows people who are different uh, to obtain a larger uh, global pro uh, product by cooperating. Right? So a fisherman and a, and a baker by cooperating can produce a greater output, both in, in terms of fish and in uh, terms of bread, than if each one of them had dedicated a part of his time both to bread making and to fishing. And the reason of uh, the, uh, the explanation of this little miracle is that uh, specialization is that people are different. Some people are better fishers, some people are better bakers. So if the better baker can dedicate 100% of his time to baking, well, he will turn out more, uh, more bread. And if the fisher does the same thing, he will turn out more, uh, more fish at the end of the day. And that's why the aggregate product of this little community of two will be higher if they cooperate, if they coordinate their activities, than if they don't. And the same thing holds true across generations, and uh, it's a very strong uh, image of this, of course, that the family, and the family, uh, we have uh, uh, complementary uh, talents, right, so uh, with uh, specialization. So I do all important things in our family that relate to politics and uh, uh, astronomy and uh, uh, theoretical economics and, and so on. And my wife does the more mundane things of uh, determining where we go for, on a vacation, what we eat for lunch, and, and all these things. <laughs> and that's very productive at the end of the day. So the division of labor is what brings people together. It's not necessarily love. We cooperate with people, and Mises emphasizes this point very much, even though we might not like these other people with whom we are interacting. Uh, we Actually, we might, if we are of a little aggressive nature, we might actually prefer to slap them in the face and say, but if I do the slapping thing, well, this guy will not bake bread for me or will not fish, fish for me. So I better be peaceful, keep my mouth shut, and just go on. Uh, uh, cooperating with him on a punctual basis. And the division of labor is therefore a wonderful way of coming to uh, and benefiting from partial agreements. Okay? And this, this whole issue about, of uh, disagreements and agreements is something that we do not usually pay much attention to because we uh, typically come from the same culture. We have the same cultural background. Okay, I'm, I'm European and, and German, but in particular, so I'm not fully in, in tune with, with you guys, who are most of you uh, Americans, but we still have lots of things that we share. Uh, dedication for liberty and so on, dedication for truth, uh, for, for justice, various other things. We have lots of things that, on which we agree. And uh, this makes us overlook that actually uh, in most 
uh, relations that we have with most other people, actually we don't agree on many things. Right? And of course, and, and this is very painful whenever we uh, meet a diehard lefty, right, or, or whatever, feminist and, and so on, then there is actually not much on which we agree at all. And uh, that's really uh, also something that we meet then in the family, right? Of course, my wife sometimes dare to disagree with me. <laughs> uh, and, and if you look at divorce rates, you see, I mean, how difficult it is actually even to get a two-person relationship, two-person community, even if it's not communism, it's something just plain contractual and so on, get this going just over three years. What's the divorce rates of most young marriages after three years? It's, it's approaching 50%, right? It's just uh, mind-boggling. So even two people cannot, can barely agree <laughs> on, 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 on most things. It's very difficult. So how should we expect that the, the whole country could agree on, uh, on anything? Um, so this is really a little miracle. And the, the wonderful thing of a free society, which is based on the, the principle of private property, is that it allows to steer around such uh, disagreements because the, 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 the free society is built on the principle well, that everybody is doing things as he prefers, as he likes or she likes, within her own realm. And the realm is precisely what we own. With all my, my own stuff, I can do what I wish as long as I don't intrude on, on the property of others. So that's a way of sidestepping the conflicts that would exist if we didn't have any private property, if there's no separation between mine and thine. And, and so then, based on private property, we can cooperate with others on partial agreements. We don't need to agree on everything. I can hire a feminist, and she's doing work for me, uh, and I don't need to talk with her about her politics and, and so on, right? Or I can work with a fascist, and uh, he's, uh, what, whatever, I can work for a fascist, right? And so I'm, 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 I'm giving instruction to his employees in economics, and I don't know what I'm doing as accounting, uh, and I don't need to agree with all the rest of his life, right? So that's the wonderful thing about contracts, and it allows us to keep the peace and thereby to promote our own material interests. That was Mises' point, right? So the vision of labor is there, uh, to promote uh, the material interests of everybody, that's the minimum program on which everybody agrees. Now, Mises also thought, and this is now if things are getting problematic, he also thought that government, coercive government, was necessary. So he agreed with what um, uh, the, the, uh, Hobbes, right, in the, in the 17th century said about a state without, or, uh, well, a, a country without a government, that it would be nasty, uh, uh, nasty British and short. <laughs> oh, he said brutish, right? <laughs> so it would be, would, would be just terrible. And, uh, and Mises agreed with this. And now the amazing thing is he does so without any discussion. It's just a matter of plain evidence. And uh, so in, in retrospect, this is a bit um, uh, disappointing for us because we are used now to all this literature coming from Rothbard and, and Hopper and, and various other people who, ex, who have uh, performed exactly that, a comparative analysis of uh, coercive and non-coercive forms of, of, of governance and uh, come to the conclusion, well, that actually a free society, in a free society, you can have governing services without uh, intruding on the property rights of other people and th that would uh, involve superior outcomes as compared to a, a coercive solution. So Mises posits simply, he doesn't argue, he posits, it's self-evident, we need government. Now what form of government do we need? Um, well for him, he makes the case for a government of self-determination, uh, uh, self-government, uh, self-rule, right? And that's for him uh, democracy. So, say a few more words um, uh, about this. And the great thing about this form of government, according to Mises, is that it allows for peaceful tr transitions of power. By allowing occasional plebiscites, uh, so there's a vote, uh, we uh, assure, ensure that um, it's not necessary to conduct a violent or to have a violent confrontation over the exercise of of power, right? As soon as it gets violent, well, people can no longer cooperate. If they're fighting over who's ruling the country, well, uh, they, 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 they won't cooperate, and um, they will all suffer as a consequence. Now, Mises uh, thought that uh, different territories should be allowed to secede. So there's a little quote here, right? So he says, whenever the inhabitants of a particular territory 
whether it be a single village uh, or a whole uh, district or a series of adjacent districts, uh, make it known by a freely conducted plebiscite that they no longer wish to remain united in the state to, uh, to which they belong, uh, but uh, wish either to form an independent state or to attach themselves to some other state, their wishes are to be tolerated uh, and complied with. Okay. And uh, so that in, in principle, he says, well, it was, this, this principle should hold down uh, to the individual in principle. Uh, the problem is only that the individual is too small of a unit to be uh, relevant from an administrative point of view. Now, what he, does he mean con uh, concretely uh, with this? He doesn't tell us, right? So that's, uh, again, he leaves us a, li a little bit unsatisfied. Now, there is no political economy of uh, government in Mises writings. There's no comparative analysis of pros and cons and, and so on. There's no analysis of the, the natural evolution that such government would take. So therefore, we need to highlight well that the logic of co coercion in, in democracy, uh, so the idea that we uh, introduce the uh, collective decision-making by coercion, that is, everybody is uh, obliged uh, by uh, uh, a sanction of uh, invasions of his own uh, property, uh, so can be incarcerated or can be robbed by, by other people if he does not partake in the collective decision-making or accept the co uh, collective uh, decision-making as being relevant for himself entails uh, certain consequences, right? First of all, it changes the, the nature of political debate, right? Because uh, if, if you are on a... Uh, basis of, of equality, you're arguing back and forth, and you might not agree, but you're still accepting the other person as uh, an autonomous uh, being, uh, and you would, in principle, you accept whatever he um, or she might, might think about an issue. As soon as collective decision-making comes into play, you no longer really care what the sports person thinks or has to say or, or argues, but you're only interested in the final result, and I mean in the decision. So this comes to trump everything. So this changes the attitude toward the others and uh, thereby more or less automatically brings about the formation of political parties. Because if it's, if it's really the decision that counts and no longer the agreement, right, then we are working toward getting the right decisions uh, being cast. Right? So it's no longer possible that we have, or necessary that we have truly communion uh, 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 and agreement with other people, but uh, just that we um, follow the, the, the same decisions. And the consequence is the political process that we see uh, at, at work in our societies, in which we not only have centralization with each uh, party, but also the cartelization of uh, different political parties, insofar as they pursue uh, the same objectives, namely power. And this is what we might call the political roundabout. Right? So it's this roundabout production like in, um, in, in, in firms as well, when the entrepreneur invests capital and uh, uh, tries to make sure uh, that uh, the, the objective is reached by eliminating all obstacles uh, on the way. So political roundabouts in involve most notably the preparation of elections. So you're subsidizing the right uh, candidates. You make sure that the wrong candidates not be uh, funded uh, by, by, by any competitor. You make sure that you um, uh, rule out competition as far as possible. So we, uh, Tom Woods talked about the, the COVID policies and so on. It was a great concern of public health uh, officials that there be no alternative, that all states follow the same policies, that if possible, all countries in the world follow the same policies and so on, right? All of this is part of the political roundabout process. And the consequence is the emergence of a political system of the sort as we know it today, right? And so as a consequence, there is not much left on the menu to choose from, right? From the political uh, menu, and what is left is usually left. And as a consequence, we have this growing opposition between the rulers and the ruled. Uh, and therefore, Mises' argument, strictly speaking, only holds true in the sh very short run in which we have a nascent democracy that comes out of a previous uh, political regime, but doesn't, isn't characteristic for developed democracy as, as we know it in our Western world today, right? Old democracies uh, are uh, characterized by very long political roundabouts uh, in, uh, in, in which, uh, therefore, it's virtually impossible that the, the ruled have any, uh, can weigh in to a significant extent in the, uh, in the selection of the of rulers. And this um, 
leads us to the root of the problem, which is coercive dem democracy, not democracy uh, as such. Right? So Mises' argument that democracy preserves a peaceful transition of power holds true only in the short run, not in the long run. Right? And uh, of course, the political production process is uh, uh, worthwhile, especially if the state grows large. And in a democracy, coercive democracy, there's nothing that prevents the government from becoming large. And as the, uh, the stakes become high, also the monastery stakes become high, it's worthwhile to invest uh, significant capital in the uh, political production process. So therefore, uh, I will say, yeah, uh, Mises on democracy is a very interesting uh, case intellectually, um, but it doesn't change uh, the fundamental problem that we've been addressing at, at this conference, namely our coercive government is our, our enemy. And with this happy thought, I'll thank you for your attention. <laughs>